Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Charles J. Sykes, the author of eight books on current affairs, including A Nation of Victims. He is the former longtime host of the number one conservative talk radio show in Wisconsin. In December 2016, he stepped down, writing in the New York Times, the conservative media is broken and the conservative movement deeply compromised. He is now a regular contributor to MSNBC. His new book is How the Right Lost Its Mind. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Charlie. Good to be with you. It's uh, we're recording this on November seventh, two thousand seventeen, which means it's three hundred and sixty-four days since the election of Donald Trump to the presidency. Before we get too much into the details, in a nutshell, uh, <laughs> what happened and how surprised <laughs> were you? Well, that was one of the reasons why I wrote the book was to step back and ask myself. Uh, what did, what the hell just did happen to us? What happened to us as a conservative movement? What happened to the Republican Party? What happened to the country? And it's obviously a complicated story. Um, I was quite surprised that he won that election. I actually was thinking, trying to think back to what, what I was thinking about two days before the election. And I was, I'll be honest with you, I was imagining that conservatives would have the opportunity to go off into the wilderness and to rethink um, our fundamental values and uh, pr present a more or less unified critique of, of Clintonism. But I did not see, um, I didn't think that Donald Trump was going to win. Um, and of course, this the whole last year has been an extraordinary intellectual and political adventure, hasn't it? Almost feels like conservatives still managed to end up off in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I, it, it did. And I, and I do think that, that actual conservatives are, are really in the wilderness. And uh, as it turns out, I think uh, uh, principled conservatives who took many of the ideas, um, you know, small government, limited government, constitutionalism uh, seriously, uh, we're not only in the wilderness, we're, we're on a much smaller desert island than I was expecting. And your background, as you write about it in the book, is is a little different. You, you say that maybe one reason you weren't so bewitched by populism and, and the stuff that came up with Donald Trump is because you're a product of the left. Well, e yes and no. I mean, you know, part of it was I, I described myself as a recovering liberal. Um, my, my father was a longtime activist. So, so I didn't come by my conservatism by birth. Um, I came by my conservatism by a long process of thinking and reading and going through the ideas. You know, it wasn't like being born into a church. Uh, it was it was something that that I thought I understood during the 1970s. Liberalism uh, became increasingly extreme, uh, implausible to me. Uh, I thought reading the works of uh, Milton Friedman, Frederick Hayek and George Will um, made it made a lot more sense to me than what we were what we were seeing from uh, mainstream leftism. So I, I guess in part it's because I always took conservatism seriously, not as a tribal identity, but as as an idea, as as a concept. And I think one of the shocks of 2016 was realizing how in fact that that intellectual element of conservatism was perhaps a much thinner crust over the movement than I had expected. Now, of course, right wing cranks and crackpots are new to conservatism. No, yeah, and you and you point out things like J J John Birch Society and uh, anti semitism, and it, has it always had this undercurrent? I guess would be the right way of putting it. Yes, it it, it has, and uh, two points to make about that. Uh, number one. There was a time when the conservative movement had uh, gatekeepers like William F. Buckley Jr. who were able to excommunicate um, those crackpots and those cranks. And I go back into the 1960s when he drew a red line uh, about the the you know extreme paranoia of the John Birch Society when he expelled you know folks like the Ku Klux Klan, not because he was squishy or because he was a rhino or because he didn't take anti communism seriously. But because he, he recognized that those that those kinds of movements would um, deface uh, conservatism, would, would make it impossible for the movement to be taken seriously. Fast forward to 2016, we realize is there is no one with that moral authority, that intellectual authority uh, to act as a gatekeeper to exclude the uh, to exclude the cranks and the crackpots who made made a recovery. But I will also admit, that's the first point. The second point, I will admit that we always knew they were there, but I always thought that they were on the fringes. And I think that along with a lot of other conservatives, perhaps we didn't 
Um, we, we didn't take their presence seriously enough. We didn't push back on them uh, enough. Uh, and as a result, folks on the fringes made their way into the mainstream of at least the conservative movement uh, last year. Do you think that the, the people who pushed them into the mainstream, so the people who voted for Trump who hadn't, you know, especially like there were a lot of them had been Obama voters before they were Trump voters. But do you think that this the ideas and the movement that they represent is a relatively new occurrence? Or do you think that they've always been kind of a larger part of conservatism or the GOP than we we suspected and that something just kind of catalyzed them? in the 2016 moment? Well, that's an excellent question. And that's one of the things that I that I wrestled with here. And I, I, I think I would come down with the on the uh, uh, to the latter explanation that there was a lot there that that we had um, ignored or missed, in part because the, the conservative movement was never quite as coherent and unified as we all thought it was. Well, not that we all thought it was, um, but there were a lot of disparate elements that were held together under this uh, under the big tent. During the Reagan years, they were held together by anti-communism um, and a variety of other, um, uh, you know, you know, uh, were, were anti-Obamanism. But the reality was there, there were real tensions in, in, in the conservative movement between social conservatives, libertarian conservatives, uh, populist conservatives versus Chamber of Commerce conservatives. And I think that for a long time, the establishment Republican Party had ignored um, the way in which its base had changed, and including how blue collar its base had really become. I often say that in order to understand the modern conservative movement, you have to understand it as a persecution movement. Uh, <laughs> as someone who came, I mean, my background and my parents were conservative, became more libertarian, not being religious, it kind of moved us into libertarians when I was growing up. But I did grow up saying, you know, the, the media is left, Hollywood is left, public schools are left, universities are left, and these, these little shining lights of sanity out there, and we're all being persecuted. And I think that a lot of conservatives over the – since, I would say, William F. Buckley kind of developed a persecution movement. Uh, but now that sensibility might have backfired, it seems. <laughs> uh, no, I, you're, you're exactly right. And, and you know, and, and by the way, all of those things that you said are true. Exactly. About, about – I mean, every, every, everything you're describing is in fact accurate. Um, and we, we see this on university campuses on a regular basis. But yeah, that, that persecution complex, that sense of being under siege is, is central to understanding the conservative movement. And, and as I write in the book, you know, the conservative movement, you know, yes, is reactionary, but it had something legitimate to react against. Um, the overreach of the left, uh, the browbeating of the left, all of those things. But you're right, at some point, the conservative movement seemed to have adopted the culture of victimization. And one of my one of my early books that I wrote was called *A Nation of Victims*, which argued that everybody in America, at some time or another, can claim victim status. Uh, well, somewhere along the line, conservatives <laughs> decided that they would like to uh, play that victim card, and and that's that's a constant theme uh, that that they are under siege, they're under attack, they're looked down upon, they're being insulted, and and you see that playing out in conservative media and conservative politics all the time. I think one of the interesting things that seemed to happen with that in 2016, the direction that that took, Trump voters, when they were asked why you're voting for Trump, um, one of the, the common things was that he – it was essentially that everyone hates him. Everyone I hate hates him, so he must be doing yes. something right. That the, the victimization turned into, well, my politics now are – whatever will most upset the people I see as victimizing me. That is exactly right. I, I, I think it's important to understand that, I, you know, my book does not beat up on everybody that voted for Donald Trump. I want to make that clear that they, they are not the ones necessarily who lost their minds um, because I, many of them, I think, did think it was a binary choice. But, but what you're describing is exactly right. The conservatives really became very clear about what they were opposed to and who they hated, less so um, focused on what they were for. But that, that tribal identity cannot be overstated. And the way in which conservatism became basically um, not so much pro-liberty as anti-leftism 
uh, is also part of this story. And anti-leftism is basically everything we do is about liberal tears. If the if the, if the left is upset about it, then it must, by definition, be right. If somebody on the left hates someone, they must, by definition, be uh, doing something right. Well, that's deeply satisfying <laughs> for a long period of time. But as you point out, there comes a point where it goes, okay, maybe this got out of control. Uh, maybe now suddenly, you know, our, our 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 desire to annoy the left has led us into uh, cul-de-sacs that are going to be very very hard for us to uh, extricate ourselves from. Yeah, you point out in the book that some people did seem to predict this. Uh, you particularly highlight uh, Ross Duthat and Raihan Salam, who predicted a, a populist element to the conservative movement, including for kind of leaving behind the working class. But the one that really struck me was you quote Kevin Phillips writing in the 1970s. The quote is, then there are other conservatives, many I know, who have more in common with Andrew Jackson than Edmund Burke. Their hope is to build a cultural siege cannon out of the populist steel of Idaho, Mississippi, and working class Milwaukee, and then blast the Eastern liberal establishment to ideo institutional smithereens. That is a that is a quote that could have been written yesterday by Trump supporters. Um, so maybe we should have been listening to some of these people or picked up on the currents that they were pointing out at least. You know, of all the interviews I've given, you're the first person that picked that quote out. And, and I remember when I read that, I really sat back and went, wow. So this this is this is these are the 1970s. We mm -hmm. are talking about something that happened, what, 40 you know, it was written 40 years ago. So many of the roots of this dissatisfaction, um, I mean, were, were much deeper. And I have to admit that, you know, particularly when I read some of the work of the Reformacons, um, you know, Russ Duthat and, uh, uh, and, and, and others, I did ask myself, um, why didn't we pay attention? I mean, these things were out there, people going, hey, you know, understand that uh, there's real, there's a real gap here between uh, much of the grassroots and, and the quote unquote elites, a word that I, by the way, dislike more and more all the time. Um, but, you know, what was it that caused us to, to brush that aside? And I think it's because we had gotten so caught up in our hyper partisanship. Uh, it, it, everything was about winning the next election. And when when you are just focused on winning that next election and causing liberal tears, then you're less willing to ask the tough questions about you know, what does it mean to be a conservative? Why, why are conservatives supporting this particular program? Why, why are we not talking about something else? So uh, we, we as conservatives um, did not, I think, engage in the kind of introspection over those years that probably would have uh, helped us avoid uh, the Trumpocalypse. How much of this declining influence on the part of the conservative elite is a result of shifts in the media landscape and the technology of media that you know for for decades up until very recently your your main source of news and opinion on political issues was outlets that were controlled by and populated by those elites you know the the national review right. and its ilk um, but then the the internet and particularly social media switched it allowed it allowed more fringe voices so maybe alex jones is an extreme example to reach much larger audiences and so and i wonder i wonder not just how much of an impact that had in kind of dragging people away from the the elite opinion but also whether that was a change that the elites almost didn't notice until it was too late like they just assumed you know for years right. we we speak and everyone's listening and then suddenly people just weren't really listening anymore while well, they just went on speaking. You know, we could spend the whole show talking about this because that transformation uh, really, I, th I think, goes to the heart of, of what happened. Um, one of the other th most interesting things that I came across that surprised me as I was doing the book was the realization that back in the 1980s, um, you know, during the Reagan era, you know, the, the golden age of conservatism, Conservative media pretty much did not exist. The conservative ecosystem that we now have was not there. There was no conservative talk radio to speak of. Uh, the Fairness Doctrine was not uh, repealed until the end of, of really, you know, the, the, the almost at the end of the Reagan of the Reagan administration. So all you had was, if you were a conservative, you had National Review. 
Um, you know, perhaps you would read the American Spectator or you would read the Wall Street Journal editorial page. But that was pretty much it. Um, the what we think of as the conservative media didn't come until after, you know, Rush Limbaugh, what, 1987, 1988. Uh, Fox News did not go on the air until 1996. Uh, you didn't have Breitbart, I think, until 2006. So all of that is very, very recent. So going back to your question, yeah, the, I, I think that you did have a conservative intellectual uh, infrastructure that thought that conservatism was defined by National Review, Weekly Standard, Commentary Magazine, Wall Street Journal editorial pages. These were the things that I read. I'm going to make that clear. I was one of these people. And we thought that that was what conservatism was about when, in fact, the center of gravity had changed dramatically and permanently, perhaps. Uh, you know, clearly, the influence of Fox News and talk radio can't be overstated. Uh, they became they became the gatekeepers for the conservative movement so that you had this very dramatic book ending where in the mid 1960s, William F. Buckley Jr. and National Review had the power and the authority to expel the John Birch Society. But in early 2016, when National Review magazine, again, Buckley's magazine, devoted an entire issue to stopping Donald Trump, it was like brushed off like a gnat. It had no impact whatsoever. And I think that 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 uh, th those bookends tell you how dramatically the center of gravity had changed in the conservative media. It's interesting that the conservative history going back to Buckley and National Review is this sort of escape, escape from the mainstream. So start your own magazine. Mm -hmm. And then when when conservatives couldn't control media when we had Walter Cronkite and the three networks is a, we're going to go to talk radio and then we're all going to start our own uh, news channel and then we're also going to start think tanks like the Heritage Foundation and to, to a lesser extent Cato insofar as we have conservative leanings mm -hmm. and all this stuff was just if you're not going to listen to us we're going to do our own thing and, and maybe we could look at the Alex Jones Alt-right, Breitbart is another example of that because the the old counterculture becomes the establishment. So now the establishment is National Review. It's no longer the counterculture. And Alex Jones is doing what National Review did uh, back in the 60s. He's, he's telling a different narrative than what the conservative establishment is, wants you to believe. Well, yes, but of course, the, the, the original media was, in fact, reality-based and fact-based as opposed to uh, Alex Jones. Well, there are those facts things. That's true. That's an important distinction. Yeah. <laughs> But, but but the story you tell is uh, is fascinating because it's basically the story of my career up until now. I mean, I was part of uh, everything you have described. Um, and, you know, when I got into conservative talk radio in the early 1990s, I thought it was an incredibly exciting and important thing to create an alternative counter media to the mainstream media. And this was, a, a, you know, a remarkably uh, important and I, and I thought hopeful development. And, it, and, of course, then you had the, the blogs and the, the Internet and all of these competing voices that broke the monopoly on information of the mainstream media and democratized it. All of this is good. This was something that I championed. At the same time, uh, you, you had this explosion of think tanks, uh, the, the development of an intellectual infrastructure that I was also very, very uh, close to. Uh, I was very good friends with some of the people at the Bradley Foundation. Um, I affiliated myself with uh, local think tanks here in, in Wisconsin. And so this was an exciting period of time where the left no longer had a monopoly on ideas and it no longer had a monopoly on communication. So, again, now we come up to where, where we're at. You did have this transition where you did be, have you know these new voices – I would argue less responsible, um, less serious voices. Uh, you did have the what I described as the grifter class, hmm. um, who became part of the business of talk radio, the business of cable television, and I think a lot of those people were less interested in ideas than they were in clicks and ratings and fundraising. And this new generation, I think, was was uh, was much more open to the kind of demagoguery that we saw last year than the previous generation. I think the original generation um, was interested in ideas, had a real vision for the country, was really grounded in principles, 
but that they were eventually replaced by a, a media infrastructure with very different incentives and very different priorities. Well, there are some ideas, um, maybe not so much Trump's, but I guess nationalism is an idea. It's, yes. It's... It has a long pedigree of people defending it, uh, some monstrous people, but maybe some fairly smart people, people who think that there has to be some homogeneity in a society and things like that. Yeah, but that's an idea. I don't, think, I don't think the nationalism we're seeing now is even idea-based. I mean, it's not, it's it not like these not. people are you know, pointing back to Carl Schmitt. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's more just gut reactions and – you know, fear. I, I don't. I don't see even ideas in that. But even when it comes to ideas, stuff. We, uh, like Charlie, you mentioned uh, our, our friends down the street, the Heritage Foundation. You put some blame on too. Considerable blame. Well, let me, let me just address that that point because I, I do think that see, here, here's where guys like us, and I mean the three of us, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we're at a disadvantage in sometimes because we actually think of politics in terms of ideas and policies. Uh, and the consequences of those policies. Yeah, we're naive, I know. <laughs> where, where, whereas it, it turns out that for a lot of Americans, uh, politics is now more about attitude than about those specific ideas. It's about the tribal loyalty. It is that gut, visceral sense. So yes, you can, and, and, there, and there are quote unquote intellectuals who will try to put a veneer of ideas over some of this. Um, but I, but I think that that's kind of you know ex post facto reasoning. Uh, you asked me about the Heritage Foundation, and I do have a chapter devoted to the switch that they made. Um, you start off by understanding how crucial the Heritage Foundation was in the intellectual development of the conservative movement, particularly of Reaganism. So they played a very particular role. But somewhere along the line, they decided that it wasn't enough for them to be intellectual leaders; they had to be activists. And I do think the moment when they decided that they were going to uh, be be players was was one of those those decisive moments in where in conservatism, where I I think that that rather than being this very serious substantive source of conservative ideas and information, not, not always right. I don't agree with everything they've ever done, but at least at least you. I mean, I I, I certainly remember writing books where. I relied very heavily on on some very thoughtful research they did. Absolutely. That then they bring in Jim Dement, who decides to make it a political, um, a, a to weaponize it politically, um, and basically turn themselves into an arm of what I've called a perpetual outrage machine, where you know you're you're pushing for government shutdowns and you're you're beating up on politicians who who don't embrace this tactic or or that tactic, and and that was that was. A decisive move from the conservative movement being policy based to being anger based, and we've seen the consequences of of that as well. How does the Tea Party fit into all of this? That's one of the that's a heartbreaking story for me, because just like our discussion of the conservative media, I was a big fan of the Tea Party when it first came on. Uh, you know, um, grew up. Uh, I thought of it as an incredibly uh, hopeful development, a grassroots development. But in very short order, I, I, start, I remember asking myself at the time, OK, who are these people who claim to be representing the Tea Party? All of these organizations that were out there who um, were raising money and calling themselves Tea Party this or Tea Party that, um, many of them in retrospect turning out to be scam packs. Um, this was a movement that... I think had you know legitimate uh, concerns w was actually uh, I, I think in many ways a, a, a spontaneous um, uprising of, of conservatives, but it was hijacked by by grifters and charlatans, um, and um, so I, I know that they're often blamed for other things that have happened. But if you listen to what the the, the Tea Party folks were saying, you know. They really were pushing back against a government that was, uh, you know, out of control, uh, a debt that was a massive intergenerational transfer of, of wealth. And you kind of wonder where that original, you know, those original folks are today. Ann Coulter, I have to ask you about her because I, I she's fascinated me for a long time. I met her briefly once and, and you talked about going on television, I think, with her at one point. But for her, she's always struck me as – Fascinating. I can't decide if she actually believes what she says. Um, I sometimes call her an anti-Tinkerbell, which is 
You know, you have to clap to keep Tinkerbell alive. You have to hate her to keep her alive. That's like actually what gives her strength. Um, but she was one of the That's first great. Trump supporters. Uh, and she actually had a line, which I had never seen you write in a book, that she said that Trump could perform abortions at the White House as long as he kept the immigrants out. Um, wow. so, so I guess too, it's like, was, was she always this way? Was she always kind of in the Trump camp? And, and I guess the second question is, do you think we should take her – or people like her seriously as actual like thinkers, or are they do, playing an act more than actually thinking deeply about problems? You know, one variation of, of my book would do is how the right lost its mind would have been just to take a series of of biographies of certain people and and, and trace how they they changed, um, and she would be one of them. <laughs> yeah, because there was a time, and I could be naive here where I actually thought she was um, a relatively serious thinker. I, I think she's incredibly bright. I Me think too. she's Me an too. incredibly effective writer. Um, but somewhere along the line, um, she did basically, you, it, it, she, she did become the prisoner of her own shtick. But more disturbing um, was the way that uh, she kept escalating and raising the ante of really and I don't want to sound like a liberal here, but I've been mean, really offensive, over the top uh, rhetoric, you know, including the column she wrote after 9-11 that got her fired from National Review mm -hmm. about basically, you know, uh, going into all the Muslim countries and bombing them and converting them to Christianity and things like that. And uh, some of the other things that she seems to revel, she seemed to, I mean, she seems to revel in doing things that are specifically designed to make people hate her, specifically designed to outrage folks. And at a certain point, that's less thoughtfulness than it is than it is kind of shtick. So I honestly can't get into her head, and I've been on many shows with her, uh, or several, whether she believes all of this. She's certainly intense about everything she says. Um, but I do wonder, um, I do wonder uh, about a, a kind of conservative that is more a brand, branding themselves, you know, p selling a brand, than it is engaging in anything that's going to enlighten us. I wonder how much that's that point plays out in the the broader picture because so we we you know for a while there was on on the internet there were the the clickbaity headlines. There mm -hmm. was like that website like Upworthy that would always be you oh, know there, there aren't clickbaity there, headlines there are, but they anymore. Seem to, they don't seem to be as much a thing. But I maybe think I'm, Facebook maybe killed I'm Upworthy. But, yeah, but, yeah. but you know that would be so it was it was basically manipulating you. It was like you know you won't like ten things that do X and you won't believe number five or mm -hmm. whatever else. And that, that they just they figured out that certain things kept people engaged, kept people tuned in or clicking, um, and it seems like the the conservative outrage machine and as represented by people like Ann Coulter who might be just kind of playing a character because it it works and gets ratings that that almost ratings became the the thing you chased and that as a result it it like broke a generation to some extent i remember seeing someone on twitter wrote um, and I, I can't remember who it is, so I can't give them credit. But they said Fox News did to our parents what our parents feared violent video games would do to us. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I had not seen that. That's really good. <laughs> I, I, I do think there is something to that. It be, we became addicted to it so that you know, the getting the clicks, getting the ratings, uh, winning the elections became the end in and of itself. It's the self-justification. And – you know, I mean, you know, sort of ju jump ahead here in terms of branding and being the ultimate uh, clickbait politician. Is is anybody more clickbaity than the current president of the United States, <laughs> who basically figured out that okay, um, I, I I may not have a coherent philosophy of governing, but I have a brand to sell, and I know how to use social media to hook people, and that's pretty. That's very much part of the story of 2016 and 2017. Now, we've been blaming the, the right a lot, and of course, they deserve a ton of blame. Um, but what about the left? There, there are things that they're not – many things that they're not pretty, particularly good at. They have their own problems. Uh, one that has been written about a lot and you highlight is the crying wolf problem, for example, that they spent the last – whatever, 40 years labeling every Republican as a, as a racist, uh, you know, idiot basically or a, a racist um, 
just basically a racist. I mean, like you know, a, yeah, a, like bigots. Uh, yeah, uh, oligarchical racist. I mean, Romney had the most insane things written about him, and and I can't remember who you cite from the left who kind of had a mea culpa where they said, okay, yeah, I, I called Romney a you know oligarchic racist, and maybe that was a little bit over the top because then someone actually came along like that, and we had a problem where suddenly we're crying wolf the entire time. Um, <laughs> That seems to be a problem. What, what other sort of things, uh, that and other things that the left might have a blame for this? Well, I, I'm really glad you brought this up because, for, first of all, there is a, um, there's a huge amount of um, pushback uh, from the left ab about that. When I basically said, you understand, you know, why there was so little reaction to uh, the alt-right uh in, in 2016 is because you guys had been making this allegation. Uh, and... Uh, I, I, I will I will tell you that that um, uh, I, I get a lot of criticism from left wing media on on particularly this point. They don't want to be told that because, of course, uh, th their narrative is that, uh, no, um, conservatism has always been awful. It's always been sexist. It's always been xenophobic. It's always been dumb. And Donald Trump is the perfect expression of conservatism. And everyone's conservative is directly responsible for Donald Trump. This is the left wing argument uh, that you get right now. But there's no question about it. And I try to make this point whenever I possibly can, uh, to, you know, on when, when I appear on liberal media, which is, you know, uh, again, understand that if you have called John McCain a racist, if you have called George W. Bush a racist, if you have called every single person, every conservative uh, for the last 50 years, if you've called him a racist, don't be surprised when playing the race card is met with a shoulder shrug an eye roll and this again. This became the left's way of telling conservatives, you're bad people, shut up, we're not taking you seriously. And as a result, as you point out, when the real thing comes along and the alt-right is the real thing, um, you know, they didn't have – they were out of ammunition. They didn't have any words. Really, the really flip, racist, the, yes. The, right, they, these are the – no, 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 really, seriously, guys, these are the real racists. Yeah, right. supremacists, yes. But, but the flip side is that we conservatives – and I put myself in this category – I think we'd been numb to it, that we had been so used to, you know, basically saying, yeah, 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 that we really kind of ignored the fact that there were some pretty scary folks over on our side and we didn't do anything about them. And we didn't call them out because they were our allies. Let's be honest about it. They voted with us in elections. So what was the point of picking a fight with, uh, with, with them? I think if you were existing in the conservative intellectual class, you you may have believed that the party was a party of ideas, as had, had been said before, and National Review and all these things were representative of it, but that might not have been the case. You, you write about a specific caller when you were talking yep. about um, uh, a candidate in Wisconsin, I believe, who said that maybe we should deport all Muslims, and you had a, a call-in show about that and and what happened after when you had that call in show? Well, now this was, yeah, this was a guy that was actually um, running in a Republican primary against Paul Ryan. And he was the Sarah Palin and Coulter Breitbart endorsed candidate. Uh, Donald Trump had actually said nice things about this guy. His name was Paul Nealon. And at one point, he suggested that we should seriously consider deporting all Muslims, including American citizens. Now, I, I wanted to open up the phone lines because I thought, okay, now, People will recognize that, that you know what an un-American idea this is, right? This this is one where maybe the audience and I will be on the same page and we'll understand that conservatives can be concerned about illegal immigration and everything and the war on terror, but we are not going to be rounding up our neighbors because of their religion. One of the first callers out of the box, and I still remember this vividly, Audrey from Oshkosh, who said, No, you know what? Um, we, we need to think about this and compare them basically to, uh, pit bulls that, uh, you know, that there may be good pit bulls, but the breed itself is pretty dangerous. And I will admit to you, and I know that this, some, some folks will think I'm terribly naive. I was really shocked. I was shocked that there were the people out there who would not only agree with this idea, but then would agree so strongly they would call into my show, which was a 50,000 watt show in the state of Wisconsin and articulate why we ought to basically have a religious test and expel people of a certain faith. And that's, I won't say it was the first time I realized, but I did have to sit back and go, okay, um, 
who are these people? <laughs> you know, I thought I understood who our allies were. What have they been listening to me for the last 20 years? Did I say anything that led them to think that this would be an appropriate uh, use of government power? Um, were there certain themes that I should have emphasized more? Should we have called these folks out? And I, and I still don't know the answers to those questions. How much of that is demographic and geographical isolation? So we we know that those areas of the country where people have the most contact with immigrants, whether those are or you know whether those are Muslims or Hispanic immigrants, tend to be the most positive about immigration and about immigrants. Um, how much of this is that these people? It's not. You know, it's not necessarily that they they were influenced by these terrible ideas or um, that they themselves are bad people. Although I think in some cases it can rise to that, but just that there's whole swaths of the country that really don't have much exposure to or don't know much about what it's actually like to live in a cosmopolitan place, and so they they simply assume that it must be catastrophically awful, you know, in the way that like Donald Trump talks about Chicago. Uh, I, I think that's a major factor. And there's there's no question about it, that that is one that that, that you get out into rural Wisconsin, where this woman was uh, was from. And uh, uh, I, I think it's unlikely that she actually knew any Muslims at all um, or had ever in, encountered them. So that, that's clearly a factor. But considering how we are segregating ourselves out uh, by culture and uh, by ideology, uh, that's not going to get any better. Uh, one of the things I touch on in the book is the great sorting out in American politics, that that we are increasingly becoming this blue and red. Those, those maps, the blue and red maps, actually do reflect something fundamental that's happening. That that we are actually physically now separating ourselves based on ideology, so that it's not just on social media and media that we live in different universes. We increasingly live in physically different universes. But I will say this though. And maybe just getting back to the, the whole question of ideas. One would have thought that even if you were isolated and living in you know places where you did not encounter people of different religions, still, there's obviously something missing in the American tradition if people would think that this was a good idea. That I, I guess I had thought that the idea of you know the values of the Declaration of Independence, the values of the Constitution – ideas of religious tolerance and religious freedom, all of those things had been inculcated to the point that you still wouldn't think that you would expel people, your neighbors, because of of, of their re religion. So the, the whole idea of, and I know this is something that, that you know that you focus on, this idea of, of freedom and liberty was thinner on the ground. Um, particularly among conservatives, than I had imagined. I'd always suspected that perhaps there was there was that 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 there, but you would have hoped that that those ideas, which had been very strongly articulated by people like Ronald Reagan, I mean, go back and read his "Shining City on a on a Hill" speech. What what, what how he envisioned what America was all about. Um, I thought that's what people meant when they said. Uh, you know, I want to take my country back or when they talked about American exceptionalism. And, and apparently um, my vision of that was very different from what a lot of folks in the grassroots had. So we've we spent a while now talking about the, the kind of how we got here and the, the movements that and ideas um, or non-ideas that led us here. So now I want, to, I want to turn to more of where we are and where we're going. Um, so with with Trump in office and with the way that it's played out, um, I mean, do you see do you see these trends continuing? Do you see signs that the right can get itself back on track? Um, I mean, I guess so. We're as we're recording this, the day we're recording this, there's a gubernatorial election in Virginia that is supposed to be to some extent a referendum on Trump and Trump's movement. So how that plays out. What the returns look like tonight might, you know, change how we might answer this. But do you do you think that the the way that Trump's presidency has played out, the lack of success that he has had, is going to sap the the vigor of this movement? That the ideas can come back, or do you think we're just getting started? Well, it, it, it's very difficult to make predictions, as uh, you know, given how all of us were wrong about a year ago. 
or at least I was uh, wrong about a year ago. Um, and and it's very hard to say, you know, what's going to happen in 2018, given how strong the base continues to support Donald Trump. But let me ask the go to the sort of the the, the, the mega question: what, what what does this mean for conservatives? And and I wish I could give you a more hopeful message here, but in many ways, the election of Donald Trump has been worse for the conservative movement than than I thought it would be. Now there are people like Hugh Hewitt out there who will completely disagree with me on all of this. But what I've been struck by is the willingness of conservatives to basically roll over and to rationalize and to and to trim their sails on one issue after another. Uh, do the, the their willingness to conform to Trumpism as opposed to say, okay, here's a distinctive kind of conservatism that is not populist, not nationalist, which is not authoritarian, which in fact still respects the rule of law, that actually understands the importance of the Constitution. Uh, Those voices are muted rather dramatically. So what I see happening is that you'll continue to see the kind of polarization that we've had but that polarization will be more tribal than it will be ideologically, unfortunately. Uh, The number of uh, conservatives, I would say libertarian conservatives, who have been willing to really speak out um, loudly uh, in opposition to some of the more disturbing trends uh, in in the era of, of Trump is vanishingly small. And I, I would like to say that the more will speak out, and maybe and maybe more will. Um, but but right now, all of the forces tend to be pushing toward conformity. And I don't think that that's a good uh, I don't think that's a good trend. Well, then let me ask you about a a possible counter narrative that gets offered to that and one that that might be slightly more hopeful. And that's we hope you're right. We know from I mean, throughout the campaign and we know from people who know Trump that he's highly impressionable. Um, There is the the longstanding many people said at the Hill, you know, Whoever the last person he spoke to, whatever position they advanced is the one that he will advance. And so everyone jockeyed to be the last person to speak to him. Um, And so maybe this – what looks like conforming to Trump's agenda is perhaps a ultimately naive attempt to like, yeah, this guy is awful. We don't want to support the things he's doing, but – We've got control of both houses. We've got control of the presidency. Maybe we can finally get a handful of things done. So if we just kind of, you know, flatter him a bit, don't push back too hard, we can talk him into doing the things that we've always wanted, like reforming taxes, say. Um, and oh, and so yeah. as long as as long as we're holding out hope that we can ultimately, you know, the, there'll be lots of um, bad rhetoric, but. We'll we'll ultimately get some good things out of it, and so we're just going to kind of go along. And then maybe maybe if that doesn't happen, there'll be more pushback as they realize that this is a disaster and they're not going to push through a legislative agenda. Well, I think that what you describe is exactly what is in fact happening here, which is the the bargain that they've made that okay, we can get some conservative wins. And by the way, there's that's true um, on you know judges, uh, the federal judiciary, Supreme Court. Uh, these are, these are good things. The the rollback of the administrative state, the regulatory relief. These these are real genuine wins. But on the other hand, you have to also uh, you weigh the cost. What are you willing to spend for all of this? I mean, the butcher's bill keeps going up all the time. Um, I also think that there's two other um, counter narratives. Number one. That let, let's let's say that you're right, and we do get all these conservative wins on, on, under Trump. My concern is that by uh, the Trump the Trumpification of conservatism also means that it will be toxified, and that yes, you have these wins over the next four, maybe even seven years, uh, but then um, because the conservative movement has been discredited by its association with uh, with, with with Trump, that it ushers in a um, you know, decades of democratic dominance, uh, a la what's happening in California. And I always have that that image in my mind of, you know, like when California used to be uh, bipartisan and what it's become now, is that the model for the rest of the country? So that um, you have short-term advantages, long-term disadvantages. If, in fact, the left snaps back to power in 2020, uh, are they likely to be centrist or moderate, or are they likely to push the country towards single-payer in reaction uh, to to Donald Trump, 
also considering the way that Republicans are are governing by ramming through legislation on the narrowest of, of partisan margins with with almost you know no uh, due deliberation. Uh, what is there any reason to think the Democrats once in power? will not act exactly the same way and perhaps even more aggressively. I mean, as each, as each party ramps it up. So um, I guess I'm concerned about the backlash to that. Uh, I uh, am not seeing um, enough conservative wins to justify many of the compromises that are made. But I certainly hope that those folks who say, give it time, we're going to get some wins. I, I hope they're right. But I also don't think that we snap back from this. I think our politics has become coarsened. I think the impact on our culture uh, is is dangerous. I think uh, the willingness of more and more uh, voters and citizens to uh, uh, adjust their their moral compass, to uh, accept things that were unacceptable, to, to believe things that were untrue, uh, to cover up for corruption, I think all of that is going to leave a stain that's going to last a lot longer than the Trump presidency. At the end of your book, you offer some modest advice to fellow conservatives and some things that conservatives you, – you kind of alluded to some of those. But, but what, what – for people who are like we – like us, uh, uh, very disgusted by Donald Trump and what's happening to this country, what, what is your – but still have conservative or libertarian leanings, what, what is your advice to those people? Well, you know – you know, part part of it is 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 to step back, and this is hard for a lot of us. You know, step back from the day to day and from the you know who wins the next election, and really go back to first principles. What what is it we believe in? What is really important? Why are we conservatives? Um, all of those things. I mean, and also this is a period to recognize that you know we can't keep replaying our greatest hits from the 1980s as much as I admire Ronald Reagan. We, we, we can't become part of a zombie conservatism that, uh, you know, continually comes up with the same answers to every problem in every decade. But I also think this is an opportunity for uh, a distinctive kind of conservatism that, you know, is, is free of the crony capitalism, uh, the special interest crony capitalism that is free of, uh, that rejects the authoritarian appeal that you're often seeing, but also, you know, is willing to address some of the legitimate concerns of the Trump supporters without embracing the toxic elements of all of that. I also think that there's a moment where, because the Trump presidency is kind of such a shock to the constitutional democratic system uh, that we've had, that that I, I'm seeing an openness on the part of even people on the left, bear with me here, <laughs> um, who suddenly have have developed a strange new appreciation for things like uh, limited government, for the Bill of Rights, for the concepts of checks and balances. Uh, there might be a, a teachable moment here for why perhaps we ought not to invest um, our masters in government with as much power as the left once thought was a, a good idea. I'm sensing more skepticism of that centralized power, more skepticism of government um, across political lines than I ever have before. So, but I guess this is, this is one of those moments where I would say, don't sacrifice long-term principles for short-term gains. It's not going to be worth it. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.